Now, the cross that you see there is the replica of St. Patrick's Cross that dates to the 12th century. Now, the original can be found downstairs in the museum. Now, the cross itself was built to commemorate the visit of St. Patrick to the site in the 4th century. It differs from a lot of crosses of the period. I'm sure as you've travelled through Ireland and as you walk through the graveyard here today, you will see the Celtic cross with the circular head on top. This is slightly different. It's what's known as a Latin style cross. It has a support on one side. It also would originally have had a support on the other. On this side is a carving of Christ. Or on this side is a carving of a priest or an abbot said to be a representation of St. Patrick. And on the, ba the other side is a carving of Christ in a full length roll. Now the base stone of the cross, some people originally believed that this was the coronation stone of the kings of Munster. There is a lot of debate about this because it was thought it was more likely that the cross was all quarried in one piece. Now when they moved the cross inside in the 1980s, they discovered the base of the cross was actually hollowed out. And you'll see this on the original inside because we have a mirror and a light underneath that reflects the hollowed out base. Now it said it could have been hollowed out to make it lighter to move because if they hollowed out the base, it would make it lighter to transport. It was also said that while the clergy would have lived here, they may have used the base of the cross to hide anything valuable or anything they wanted to protect. Now there are a few myths and legends about the cross here. It is said that if you put your arms around the center piece of the cross and your fingers meet on the other side, you will never again get a toothache. It's also said if you hop around the cross nine times in an anti-clockwise direction, you'll be married within the year. Now, if that's an urgent concern for anyone, feel free to try it. But remember, it's not the original cross, so we don't take any responsibility if these things don't work out. Now, it is called St. Patrick's Cross, and another name for the Rock of Cashel is St. Patrick's Rock. Now, St. Patrick came to Ireland in the 4th century to convert the natives to Christianity. And it was said that during this period, he came to baptise the sons of Conal Kirk, the first king who would have had the Munster kingship here at Cashel. Now, while he was baptising King Angus, it was said that by accident, St. Patrick actually stabbed the crozier or the staff that he carried through the foot of King Angus who he was baptising. Instead of yelling in pain, as you think he would have done at this point, King Angus actually thought this was part of the ceremony and he suffered in silence. So I don't think there were a lot of people volunteering to be baptised after that. But it is the only story that we have linking him here to the site. And it is widely believed he would have visited here because it would have been a hugely significant site in Ireland at that time. Now the reason the original cross was put inside, was moved inside, is because it was made from sandstone. And sandstone is not a very hard wearing rock. And as you can see from the replica here, originally it stood in a very exposed position. So the cross itself was not faring that well against the elements. So for its protection and conservation, it was bought inside in the 1980s when that building was restored and a limestone replica was made and put in its original position here. Now folks, we're gonna go around this way and we're going to go to the earliest building that you find. As you walk through the graveyard here today, you will notice that some of the graves are quite new. Now, people are still being buried on site here today, but there are very strict guidelines as to who can be buried here. Now, in the 1930s, there was a view to closing the graveyard, 
because we were not that suitable as a graveyard. We were built on solid rock and some of the graves were very shallow. But there was objection before this, this was done from people from the town of Cashel who had loved ones buried up here because they wanted their right to be buried up here with their loved ones. Mm. So a compromise was reached and a register was opened in 1930 and it is only the people on the register that can be buried on site. Now there are about nine or ten names left on this register and once these people are buried here that will be it. The register will be closed and there'll be no more burials on the Rock of Cashel. Now one of the most notable tombs on site is the one that you can see at the wall there. Now this is the tomb of the Scully family, a very wealthy family within Cashel. Now although it is very large, it's a portion of what it was originally like. Now this was struck by lightning in 1976 and two or three large portions broke off it and they're still to the back of the monument today. Now no effort has ever been made to restore it. All of the graves that you see here, these are all private family graves and they cannot be touched by the Office of Public Works who look after the buildings themselves. Now we've come to the earliest building on site, which is the Round Tower. It's been dated to 1101 to when the site was handed over to the church. There was a theory that it could have been built by Murtaugh O'Brien to commemorate this event. Now Round Towers were fairly common in Ireland between the 10th and 12th centuries, and they were usually associated with religious or monastic sites. Now if you've seen one Round Tower in Ireland, you've basically seen them all, they're fairly similar. But this is one of the most complete that you will find. It is 27 metres in height, it still has its conical shaped top. Now there is a lot of debate as to what a round tower could have been used for. Now some people believe that it could have been used as a place of storage because the doorway is very high up the ground, very difficult for animals or anybody to break into if there was something stored inside. It's also said it could have been used as a place of refuge if the site was under attack. Because again the doorway is very high up the ground, all you'd have to do is climb up the ladder, pull the ladder up and you would be safe. But there's a lot of debate about this because the interior of the round tower was made completely of wood. So all you'd have to do is like the base and the whole thing would go up in smoke. Mm. So it wouldn't offer much protection in that instance. But the most agreed use of a round tower is actually as a freestanding bell tower. Now round tower in, Ir in Irish or Gaelic is clugchap, but if you translate it directly back to English it means bell tower. And there are four windows that face north, south, east and west and that's very typical of what a bell tower would have been like. Now not only would there have been a lot of ceremonies held here, but there also would have been a lot of manuscripts, a lot of important information that would have been kept on site. And it was said that the round tower had a symbolic purpose, to mark it as a place of prayer and as a place of learning, because indeed it is one of the most visible buildings on site. Now folks, we're going to continue around the path here. And we're just going to stop going to have a look at the abbey before we go into the kitchen The abbey that you can see from the site here, this is a 13th century Cistercian abbey and it was built around the same time as the cathedral. Now one of the archbishops who was involved in the construction of the cathedral, his name was Archbishop McCarwell, he was a Cistercian archbishop and he ordered the building of the abbey in the fields. Now it is open to the public, there's no guide service down there but you're welcome to wander it at will. As you're going down the hill from the site here, there's a little black swing gate on the right hand side and if you follow the path onto the road, you'll be able to access the abbey from there. Now it's known locally as Hoare Abbey, and Hoare is a very old English word. It's used to describe a colour. They would call the first frost in winter the grey frost or the hoar frost. And the monks that lived down there wore grey tunics, so it was the home of the grey monks. Now on the 20th of May 2011, we did a very special visit. Queen Elizabeth II, on her first official visit to the Republic, Republic of Ireland, visited the Rock of Cashel. Now she landed by helicopter in the field near the abbey there. She walked across the field, there was no getting around that, no matter who you were. She was driven up on site, she was shown St. Patrick's Cross. She was entertained by the choir from the local community school upstairs in the Vicar's Choral. And then she was shown artifacts relating to the site. 
inside in the cathedral. Now, as you can imagine, this was a lot of work for us coming up to the visit, but it is a day that will go down in the history of the site, and I can imagine someone in my position, 100 years from now, telling a group such as yourselves about this visit. And we do have an exhibition downstairs in our museum section about the visit itself. So feel free to take a closer look at that after your tour. Now folks, we're going to go into the cathedral here, and I'm just going to explain briefly about the cathedral. I know you're going to the chapel at Queen's. Now folks, this is St. Patrick's Cathedral. It was built in the 13th century in the Gothic style of architecture. A little bit different from what you'll be looking at in Cormac's Chapel or what may you've, you may have already seen. Now, it replaced Cormac's Chapel as the main centre of worship on site. Now, some of the Gothic features are quite obvious as you walk in. You'll see the pointed arches over the doors and over the windows, and the ceilings are much higher, the roof is much higher. And the thinking behind this was to make you feel closer to God or closer to heaven. Now, the cathedral was built over a number of decades, between 1230 and 1270, and there were three archbishops involved in its construction. It began under Archbishop O'Brien, it was continued under Archbishop McKelly, who was a Dominican archbishop and responsible for the Dominican Abbey you'll find on your way into the town, and it was completed under Archbishop McCarwell, who was a Cistercian Archbishop and responsible for the Abbey you can see from the site here. Now the layout of the cathedral, the smaller area up to the first arch there is called the nave. It's where the main congregation would gathered. The longer area that we're standing in is called the choir. It's where the old would originally be. Now over here is the north transept and this is the south transept. The central part of the cathedral is called the belfry and crossing and it's where the bell would originally have been. Now, an unusual feature about the cathedral is the nave is very short. Usually the longest part of any cathedral is where the congregation gather. It was thought that it had to be built a little bit differently to situate itself between two buildings that were already here, the Round Tower and Cormac's Chapel, and the altar area had to face east. So it literally had to be built the opposite way. Now, in the choir area, here. This is where the ceremony would have been carried out. The tall windows that you see there are called lancette windows. They're typical of the Gothic style. Now along the top of the lancette windows, the windows with the arches, these are called quatrify windows. Now they look a lot different from the outside of the building. They actually look like little flowers on the outside. So they were really more for decoration as opposed to having a functional purpose. Now the roof of the cathedral was a wooden roof. It was burned on two occasions. It was burned in the 14th century by the Earl of Kildare and it was also burned during the 1647 siege. Now during this period, the site was attacked by Lord Inchiquin on behalf of the English Parliament. And it was said that a lot of people from the town of Cashel were killed during the siege because they came to take refuge in the enclosed site. But the site is not built primarily for defence and once it was breached, the cathedral was burned and these people were killed. It was called the Massacre of Cashel. Now when the site was abandoned by the church in the 18th century and once the buildings were deconsecrated, everything of value was removed and it was the archbishop at the time made a decision to dismantle part of the roof and reuse some of the wood in the cathedral down the town. What remained of the roof would eventually have collapsed. Now he did this to avoid attacks that existed on roofs of this type because had he left the roof intact, he would have been liable for this tax regardless of the building being used. Now this is the altar area of the cathedral and it was said that the clergy would have entered onto the altar area through this doorway here. There is evidence to suggest that there would have been a side chapel there where they would have prepared for the ceremony. 
Along this wall here in the centre, we have what looks to be steps. Now, this is what is known as the sedilla. It's where the clergy would have sat at certain points during the ceremony. A little bit further on in the wall, we have the arch, which is known as the piscina. It's where the sacred vessels would have been washed. Now, about halfway up the wall, we have a distinct rectangular gap. This is what is known as a leper squint. Now, there was a leper hospital located not as far from Cashel, and if you suffered from this condition, you were segregated from the rest of the congregation. So you would have watched the ceremony through this gap in the wall from a gallery area provided. Now, this arch in the wall is actually a tomb of an archbishop who would have been here at one point, and his name was Muller McGrath. Now, he was archbishop here for over 50 years, and he lived till he was 100. Very unusual for someone in the 17th century, but he had a knack for looking out for himself, as I will explain. Now, he began his career as a Catholic archbishop, but when the Protestant church came to power, he changed his religion and he became a Protestant. Now, as you can imagine, it didn't make him very popular with his Catholic parishioners, but it was said that he still maintained a Catholic parish in the north of Ireland, where he was originally from. So he was basically playing both ends against the middle. Now, there's an inscription on his tomb that reads, Here I may lay, here I may not lay. Now, as I said, he didn't make an awful lot of friends throughout his lifetime, and there was a belief back then that if you were not punished in life, you'd be punished in death for what you did. So he implied he wasn't buried here at all to protect his tomb inside the cathedral. But it is widely believed he would have been buried here because this is where he spent the majority of his career. Now, he's also married twice and had nine children, and McGrath's a very common name around here. I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but his nickname was the Scoundrel of Cashel. <laughs> so it really tells you a lot about this individual associated with the site. Now, folks, I think we're at three o'clock, and I know you've already, you, you, are yeah. you going to the chapel? You've already been to the chapel. Yeah. So I'm just going to show you where to go, and my colleagues will take it from here then. And it was lovely to meet you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.